Get ready to whiten those knuckles and hold fast as we talk the most dangerous, daring, and epic sea stories ever told. Whether facing ruthless men who prey on other mariners, or storms that turn calm seas into graveyards. Those who go down to the sea and cast off lines enter the most challenging and dangerous environment on earth. Only here will you hear their stories and the lessons gained through their experience. I'm your host, Phil. And I'm Bill. And we welcome you aboard the Had to Go Out podcast. Before we dive into this episode, we need to provide a disclaimer. The views expressed on this podcast are those of the individuals involved and are not to be construed as official or reflecting the views of any government agency or military service. This podcast is an independent effort with no government association. Another one to check out is the Always Ready Collective, which delivers art by and for some daring fighters of the sea. Head over to Etsy, Facebook, or Instagram and search Always Ready Collective to check out their Coast Guard and Maritime-focused tattoo flash, pinups, and propaganda. You won't be disappointed. All right. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Had to Go Out podcast. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for everybody that's tuning in on YouTube. Uh, We've got got a live one for you today. That's what we're going to try and bring uh, bring more to you uh, on on the video platform, and I think we got that. So, again, thanks for uh, watching, and please subscribe if you haven't already. Yeah, thanks everybody for being here. If it's your first time, we're really glad you found it. If you just found us on YouTube, please subscribe. We, uh, we hit that first threshold so that we can do this live now. Let us know how it's going. Hit us up on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, wherever. Type in they had to go out. Find us. Tell us what you want, what we can do more of, what you'd like to see. And please subscribe. And uh, looking forward to this episode today. This is, this is going to be a cool one. Yeah, obviously there's some perks to, uh, to doing it live that uh, you know, we, we had no idea of, but, uh, but our guest today <laughs> definitely hooked us up. Uh, so uh, again, thank you guys. Tough, but, uh, tough location. Very right? tough location. Hey, so today we're coming to you from uh, Primo Cigars and Coffee out in Norfolk, Virginia. And who we have with us is Mr. Mike Vecchione. Very good. I got, you got yeah, it. I got it right. Yeah, it was, you got it. Good job. Didn't quite, not quite spell the way it sounds, <laughs> but uh, close. So Mike Vecchione, uh, born and raised out in Mount Laurel, New Jersey. Joined the Coast Guard back in 1998 with Company Echo 153. Uh, first operational unit, Coast Guard Cutter Venturous out of St. Pete, Florida. Then went to Station Cortez as a BM3. Made BM2 there, transferred to the International Training Division uh, out of Yorktown, now called the Mobile Training Branch. Went from there to the Quidnick in uh, CENTCOM, or Pat Forcois, as we now call it. Then to Station South Portland. We got to talk about how you went from, I'm sure, a priority yeah, one you were priority to one. South, South Portland. Portland was, we'll talk about yeah. it. Though. The detailer was surprised too. Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, did, a rate change, yeah. did a rate change uh, out in South Portland to uh, Maritime Enforcement Specialist. Transferred from there to Maritime Safety and Security Team New York. Uh, was on the FP team there, and then transferred to the Maritime Security Response Team out in Chesapeake, uh, where he made MEC and retired uh, just recently after 20 years of active service. So we thank you, Mike, for being thank on. Thank I'm you for having let, us. Let Bill ask a question as I drink uh, some premium yeah, coffee. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks and for letting us be here. You're drinking, you are drinking French press Southern whiskey coffee from Pale Horse. It doesn't have whiskey in it. And no, it does not. It's Southern it's whiskey. It's good. F- but it's infused. really good. <laughs> I'm gonna take a sip and then I'll ask. It's the almost like you could be at work and you could be drinking whiskey while not drinking whiskey. You're it's right. Like it's got that barrel. Flavor. And I picked that because you guys told me you were BS. It's so. perfect. I love it. Perfect. All right. So now that we've uh, BS'd our way through and put in a plug for the coffee, which is important, Mike, what's your most dangerous, daring, or epic sea story or stories? Oh, see, when you asked me like kind of beforehand, I was like alcohol related or not, joking right. around. But of course. I think really the story we need to hear is what was her name that got you to South Portland <laughs> from Pat Forsworth? It actually, it actually, actually, believe it or not, it was female related. So oh, no, we did yeah, yeah, yeah. But, uh, no surprise. Yeah, the detailer combo, that whole combo was a trip. He, he couldn't believe it, but we'll get into that. No, I think, uh, I, I don't even say daring rescue. I just think for me, like my, my the most memorable rescue I had was as a coxswain at uh, Station Cortez. Um, and you guys remember, um, you know, Back in like the early 2000s, you know, even pre 9/11, the stations more or less ran their own SAR cases as long as it wasn't multi, you know, multi-unit. 
So, as I know, it's one of Phil's favorite in subjects. The days of groups. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like in the days of group, group St. Petersburg. So, as a group OOD, or a, uh, you know, you basically just would kind of call them and check in. But as the OOD in the station, you ran your case. Right. Um, so, at the time, I was uh, I was uh, OOD, and then the first boat went out, and it was an overturned catamaran that, uh, you know, that was drifting. They couldn't find right. it. Tell us about so, real quick, what's uh, Station Cortez? What's it like? Like what, how, oh, what kind of boats you got? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, what, I don't even know what, what they have now. Back then we had a 41, uh, 41370. We you had don't the have first. That. That's not there anymore. That's definitely not No, there. of course definitely not. not, of course there. not. Yeah. Uh, we had the, the uh, first Coast Guard 25. It was 252525. Um, and then they had a. Um, we got really original on that number. Yeah, we did. Yeah, we did. <laughs> yeah, it's like not two five zero 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 one. It was just right. two five two five. And then they had the um, uh, Boston Whalers, one of the old school Boston Whalers. Okay. So uh, you know, I think towards the end when I was leaving, they were supposed to be getting. Well, they had gotten one of the new twenty fives. You know. Right. The, uh, yeah. Because you had the old the HS model. Yeah. They, had the, the seat and back that yeah. had zero shock nope. whatsoever. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. Not the metal shirt. Yeah. And actually, that one had yeah, two. Se- spot, that one had two spot. seats inside, and then the door, and it didn't even have back seats. It had these little yeah, the benches. These, yeah, they yeah, weren't yeah. even benches. They were just like a, a hump right. that you just kind of <laughs> sat on, and then closed the door, and you were like this, you know. Mm-hmm. And I'm small, so I can't imagine the bigger dudes would usually just stand with the door open, put their hands yeah, on the seats, right. which is why we all have bad knees now. Yeah. Right. Um, so I went out a second boat for the case, and I remember you know being underway OD, and I called the chief. And they were basically, but that was back when they would put all your search patterns in, you know, the uh, in the computer at the group, Mike and then when they would computer. give them, they would give them to you, and it would be like over land or over, you know yeah, what I mean? Like yeah, they didn't oh, yeah. make sense. Sure. And it hasn't changed. I'm sure, I'm sure it hasn't. <laughs> so I just remember being like with local knowledge, just there's a nasty rip current that would go off the beach, and I was thinking in my head like an overturned catamaran, you're gonna have a sail underwater, right. it's gonna act like a drogue, and it's gonna pick up that current, right. and it's not gonna drift with the direction of the wind, and you know, overturned catamaran, what your surface area is like nothing, you know what I mean? Right, yeah, Pretty yeah. much the people. Man, I love that you you became an ME, but you're still talking like Yeah, you're a buzzer. I still, I I still look, I got the through, whole man. fast on that. Yeah, nice. I love it. So I, I ended up going, um, going out on their first search pattern and I was awaiting the second search pattern and, and they wanted me to go south and I'm like, or no, they wanted me to go to north and the, the current went south and I'm like, there's no way that that boat went north. I'm like, we're going to go away from these people. So I'm not saying that I disregarded the search pattern that they sent right. me. I will say that I may have started my, my search pattern earlier than they gave me theirs. Oh, right. You didn't have information, so you had to and work with what you knew. Of course. Right. And then while they were giving Modified. me their search pattern, I was like, well, let me finish the one I'm on. Yeah, of course, <laughs> yeah. So I ended up doing my search pattern, which is a completely different area, and ended up finding the people. Weird. Right. Weird, right? So what you're saying is that the guy on scene with local knowledge yes. was able to figure stuff out that people in a room with no windows and could a compu- Yeah, of course. I'm oh, sure you're on board with this. I've yeah. always been on board wow. with it, Phil. Yeah. So I, so I, you know, although it wasn't like this da- daring sea rescue, or obviously, you know, a, I put my coxswain letter on the line. That's for sure. Cause, Absolutely. Because my, I did call the chief, and he even told me this is going to either get you like a medal, or right. it's going to get you. Con, you're going to lose your qual. This is a con <laughs> or an Article 15. Right? Yeah. Only those two ways. So, uh, so I ended up doing that. That was pretty cool. Um, cool. Those people ended up being like, I don't know, they were like donors to. Jeb Bush, I think, in Florida. So they ended up writing a letter to the White House, and I got a letter from President Bush. Like it was like a thank you letter, basically. And I thought that was pretty cool. That is really cool. Um, just kind of neat, like you know, because I, I rescued this family, and they were like, oh, because I'm thinking if we had gone north, these people would have been, yeah, they'd have been in you know the Bahamas. So that was pretty cool. Um, yeah, I mean, I you know, I had some some cool little stories here and there, but nothing, you know. I really want to hear about Maine. Okay. All right, so. Yeah. Maine. All right. I'm stuck on it. Well, no, because you guys know, what's the number one unit that people gun for out of Path Force One as a BMW? Lake Tahoe. Lake Tahoe, right? So Look at that. I knew that. Of course. So at the time, the BM1 that was on the cycle before me on the Equidnik, he picked up Lake Tahoe Lake Tahoe. on his cycle. So I'm like six months later when I transferred, I know it's not going to be open. So you guys are going to kill me when you find out the orders that I had. You're like, what? Whoa. But they gave me, at the time when the BM1s were still in charge of St. Croix, they gave me that billet, which... MSD so, St. Croix. Yeah. Which yeah. is, it's like you and two other guys. Yeah, right. yeah. and like Hawaiian shirts. Right. And a, right. And a 25. And <laughs> yeah. So I was like, man, this is going to be so cool. And I was married at the time. So 
um, I called her and told her, and she was like, well, I'm going to go to school, and I don't, I don't know if there's a good school out there, and I don't want to be that far away from family, and we're going to be isolated on an island, and I'm like, yeah, but it's an island, and it's so it's cool crazy. there. Yeah, yeah. like, <laughs> so long story short, what happened is, it was actually two things. I knew that I wanted to become an ME. Mm -hmm. because of my background at Station Cortez doing LE and before they had stood up um, the MSSTs and the FP teams, they put a bunch of the people from se uh, the groups into like a lot of Wazoo training. Right. So I was one of those guys that went through a lot of Wazoo training that, you know, I don't think anybody even talks about anymore. And then, because uh, as soon as the MIST teams came out, they, they like did away with all that stuff. Um, the, the, what they did is they took two people from each station and put us at the group as what is now a sector VBS yeah. team. Yeah. Right. But back then they didn't have that. They, they had, have a, name they had a group just... LEO, one guy, right. and they had a BM1 at the group that was like assistant LEO for right. the group. And then we were like his boarding team. Um, so I was one of the guys from the station. So I knew I really liked that stuff. And uh, I loved ITD, I loved the traveling and all the stuff we did around the world. you know. And of course you hear ITD was you know, the precursor of what they were before they were ITD. You hear all those stories, and I was like, man, I really want to get into this like special ops stuff. And uh, I also had screen for XPO, so it was like I had done enough as a BM. I was a deck watch officer, where like my career could have gone either way. Right. So it was like they were pretty, seen it pretty much what the team. pretty much what the detailer if told me. Lucky. He said, if you take an XPO job, uh, and, and I guess kind of a good thing that happened, I missed the screening for XPO at Pat Forsois. And I say I missed as in my, my CO never put my stuff out. And he was late. And since he was late, I didn't get right. screened screen for XPO. It's like so, a Bob Ross happy accident. Is yep, the way it exactly. Up. Happy yeah. accident. So I ended up getting the, uh, the, <laughs> the island billet, the dream island billet. And I'm like, hey, that's a, that's a cool job, right? And he's like, yeah, from there, man, you'll screen for XPO. You'll be good. So then I was like, well, if I screen for XPO, what if I want to go ME? He's like, well, if you're an XPO, you ain't going to get ME. You're not like, getting out of rate. You're not getting out of rate. So I was like, huh, okay. So then I was like, what if I don't want that billet? And he's like, I'd call you crazy. And I was like, <laughs> what do you have for an ops boss job stateside? And he was like, South Portland, Maine. And I was like, what else? And he's like, South Portland, Maine. He said, uh, uh, I'll get my jacket. And he goes, he goes, you can go to the Caribbean? or you can go to South Portland, Maine. And he's like, I want you to sleep on it. Don't give me the answer now. <laughs> and, yeah, and, yeah. I, and I said, uh, okay. So the next day I met up with him and, and I said, uh, you're, you're gonna think I'm crazy. And he's like, I knew you were gonna pick it. And I'm like, send me to South Portland, Maine. I will say, cool city. I, I'll be honest with you, I would choose South Portland, Maine over St. Croix. Awesome, I awesome really city. I, I will tell you. I however would not. I, I was, understand, no way you <laughs> I like snow. <laughs> After, like one, <laughs> after one, I do too, but after one year up there, and I'm not a big winter guy, but after one year up there, I was actually sad to leave. Like, I really enjoyed South Portland. Right. I was like, man, I'm really getting into the city. It was so much fun. But, uh, no, so I went the ops boss job because I knew it would be easier to get out of the rate. Right. And I knew I was going to jump ship as an ME. Um, so I did. And uh, luckily, when I was there, originally it was like, hey, wherever you're at, you got to finish. And I'm thinking, shit, I'm going to finish four years here. I'm only going to have five years left as an ME and right. I'm going to be old and I was already starting to hurt. Old and starting to yeah. break. So I'm like, being a buzz mate breaks so luckily he called me and he's like, hey, Miss New York has an open spot for their team chief. He's like, I know you're a first, but you know, you can, you can, they'll take a first that is a hard charger. And since you're coming as a BM from like a command rate, you know, they'll take you. So yeah. I was like, dope. So I went and did the tryout. The team, that really did the tier one. You know, oh, I did yeah, all that yeah, stuff. Yeah. And, uh, and eventually the brokenness caught up with me. Yeah. So, and here I am. Very cool. Broken, retired. Right. <laughs> what else? Let's say you're living your best life as I'm sitting here. Yeah, I know. Right. It's not bad. You're doing, yeah. right. <laughs> you're doing all right. Doing okay. What, um, so you said that you were in LE at, at Station Cortez and that yep. kind of like started it for you? Yeah. What, what happened down in Cortez that, that kind of kicked off that spirit? Uh, I, it was really even before, like nothing really happened. I just, as soon as I started getting into the BTM stuff, mm -hmm. I just, like even on the cutter, I mean, we had a, uh, we did the motor vessel comms drug bust. Uh, okay. At the time, it was one of the bigger drug busts the Coast Guard had done. Ten thousand. How did that go down? Ten thousand five hundred pounds. Uh, the drugs were actually uh, it was cocaine hidden under a uh, loose iron ore, which okay. was a lot of digging. Yeah, I'm sure. And a lot of red clothes. Um, but the uh, it was cool because I was just getting into it, and I was in BTM, and I was like a boat crew member, mm -hmm. and we were you know we were on the slow, the old slow four cylinder Volvo Penta ribs and we're chasing drug boats and getting our asses handed to us. But I still loved it. Right. And I was like, man, I really wanna, I just really wanna do this. 
And when I got to the station, uh, became a BO, I just, it was like a passion. Right. And uh, anything that I am passionate about, I put everything into. So just the LE stuff, I was just, I was out doing boardings all the time, like 20, 25 a day. Um, all the guys that were above they me at the time. With you, didn't they? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> some of the other BOs were like, "Yo, tone it down a little bit." Right, that's you. what I mean. You're, yeah, yeah, you're you're making us look bad. Because yeah. yeah. <laughs> then the chief would go, well, "Becky, you did 25 boardings on Saturday. Why can't you go do it?" Right. And they're like, "Killing me, dude." Yeah. When you say 25, you mean five? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so it was uh, it was a fun time, and then 9/11 happened, you know, and then of course it was. Um, I'll never forget that I was at at the group for. They used to have a training called super user training. So, before we, now, so before we had ITs, uh, you know, we had basically Windows, I think we were like Windows 98 at the time. They needed uh, somebody at each unit that could be trained up to troubleshoot the basic Windows things. So they sent you to this you little- You loved LE. So man. you were if, if you volunteered to one. go to the, yeah, help desk <laughs> tier one school, yeah. that's love and LE. Yeah, right I did. So yeah, yeah help desk nice. tier one. So I went and uh, it was it was kind of a pain in the ass at the time. I'm glad that the, the ITs came around because then you know constantly people hitting up, hey dude, my Outlook won't sync. Hey dude, my you know and right. I'm like God, yeah. leave me alone. So uh, I was there at 9/11 happened during the school, and I'll never forget. It was like the last day, and we're sitting there at the training, and somebody's like on CNN <clears throat> on the uh, website, which you're not supposed to be surfing the web, but he was bored and was reading the news, right. and then he was just like like his color just flushed from his face. And we were all like, what the fuck are you doing? And then the guy uh, the, teaching the class was like, you're not supposed to be on the internet. And this kid stood up and was like, the World Trade Center just got blown up. And everyone was like, what? And like just then, somebody came into the room and was like, who here is weapons qualified? So it was only like me and a couple other BMs that were in there, the rest were like from support units, like HSs and stuff. So I was like, I am. And they're like, go grab an M16. And at St. Pete, there's like a, a little airport. Okay. So they were like, stand along the fence line with an M16. And I'm like, for what? And they're like, anybody tries to get on a plane and take off or anybody lands a plane, you have weapons authority. And I'm like, well, are you kidding me? Like, what the hell's going on? So we didn't even know at the time that it was like a terrorist attack, you know? Right. So we, I'm standing there with an M16 on the fence line. The Venturous is, was docked up at the time right there. And they got their 50s manned. And I'm just like, this is crazy. And then someone came up to me and was like, hey, you need to get down to Cortez. You guys are getting underway. So I like hauled ass in my car over the Skyway Bridge, got to Cortez. We sat under the Skyway Bridge for like two days, like right. on the 41, just anchored with, right. the, with the 240s mounted and just sitting there like, what's going on? You know, everybody, at the time they thought they were going to be attacking bridges. And yeah, everything and, was like, what's right. going to happen next? Yeah. I remember that feeling. They like, locked the port down. The yeah. port was closed. So it was like no boats coming in or out. Um, so then after that, they basically were like in the Sea Marshal program, which eventually like became VBSS. So I was part of that. And they were like, they, they had this training with like SWAT guys and we were doing CQC and it was just like, just crazy because they didn't know what direction like the Coast Guard was gonna kind of go in. Right. Um, well, obviously a lot of that chilled out when it became VBS and the, and the MSR, or MSRT and MSSTs and EMIST and all that stuff happened. Um, and at the time I really wanted to get into that program, but ITV called and I mean, that's MTV that's, that's, now. Yeah, that's one that you don't pass up. Best yeah, job. Yeah, best telling job you, ever. best job in the Coast Guard, hands down, if you can get that job. Yeah, it's a secret stop. Yeah, don't, don't, it's horrible. You yeah, don't. Actually, really you're right. Weird. It was the worst three years of my life. Yeah, God. All 35 countries I went to, it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> okay. well, tell us a, a horrible story about what was your favorite country you went to? Uh, oh, man. Guys? So. Could be a dream story. You just can't concentrate on the training. <laughs> I know. No, it's uh, what was cool about it was that you traveled as a civilian. You know, uh, khakis and a polo shirt. We got a uniform. I don't know if they still give the allowance, but you could buy suits. You had to buy suits. You know, so they gave us like I think it was like twenty five hundred bucks yeah. uh, clothing allowance to go out and buy like all that stuff. We had like Samsonite luggage and you know frequent flyer miles. You're staying in you know Marriotts and and four hour star hotels for the most part. Djibouti, you stay in a Connex box. You know. <laughs> You stay in the nicest hotel in town, whether the nicest hotels are a <laughs> yes, or a Marriott. Right. Yeah. You're, you're right. I will say my favorite place, and I it's a place that I would actually like to go back to, was uh, Madagascar. Really? Yeah, and, and we stayed in this really cool resort, and it was like open air huts, basically. Right. But like at the foot of my bed was a volcano. Like, 
Just that's awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I stayed, and I had the mosquito netting over me, right, which right. nobody else brought, and they laughed at me until the next morning right. when they were all covered in mosquito bites. And they have malaria, and you're but, uh, rocking. Yeah. Well, no, you're taking the big green pills. Yeah, you're not I know getting that. malaria. Did you ever have any dreams on those pills? Uh, in the beginning, yeah. yeah. No, yeah, you have like hallucinations more yeah. than dreams. But I actually stopped taking them. Oh, really? And uh, my thing was there's uh, there's quinine and tonic water, so gin and tonics do the same thing. Oh, nice. I Jeez. did I did Jeez. the old I did the old old British South Africa method of anti malaria, right. and it worked. Right. And my liver is not as destroyed as it would have been on the malaria. That's, pills. that's fair. Yeah, that's fair. But the first time I ever took one, I'm like, I'm laying in bed, and I remember I was asleep, right? And then all of a sudden, like, I felt myself get up, and it was like a snake was coiled at the end of my bed. And I got in, like, the high guard for this thing. And then I woke up, and I'm like, what am I doing? You know, like, yeah. looking around. In like, fairness, there could have been a snake. I was going to say, that was a If you asked like, me, I would have been like, there was a snake at the foot right. of my bed. There, is, uh, there was a story of, it wasn't my trip, but I had heard about a guy right before I got there who, like got naked and ran out of the hotel into the street, like hallucinating. Yeah, I believe it's not, no, no drinking involved. No, no, that was actually no, malaria pills. Those malaria pills, man, no I don't know. I took them. I didn't have any effects. You didn't have anything? No, man. They, I guess they it's different me. for everybody. Yeah. I hallucinated. Like my dreams were very vivid, like mm -hmm. super crazy. We did have a guy that got bit by a spider and it like laid eggs in his leg. Oh. Um, wow. So like I had to get like I spring this little med kit. And I had a scalpel in there, and he was like, dude, you got to, because he's like, there's something hard in my leg. And I'm like, oh, dude, I bet there's eggs in there. And he's like, you got to cut them out. And I was like, I'm not trained to do that shit. But we were in Africa, and it was like. We you were, were the better option. And this was, we, where <laughs> yeah. We, yeah, where we were, we were in Sao Tome, which another place, by the way, is incredible, like, magical place. This place was like, it almost like untouched by right. civilization. Like, you know what I'm saying? It's old school plantations, cocoa plantations. The people were amazing. And it was like, just like the wildlife and everything. It's like just jungles everywhere. Like I, I couldn't believe it. It was just like, this place is so cool. But unfortunately, the animals were also right. it big was and scary. By people. By people. Yeah. So everything was like gigantic. Every bird was like, oh, that's, no, that's not a bird. That's an insect. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, he got, he got uh, the eggs, so I had to cut those out of his skin, which was gross. And then I also got bit on the face by a spider. Uh, and you could see the two marks and my face swelled up like right. I had a reaction to it. Wow, so I was like, oh God, what's wrong with my face? <laughs> so they were like, Did you wake uh, up like that? Yeah, yeah. yeah awesome. awesome. The next morning they all looked at my face and they were like, oh, <laughs> maybe you don't have to go to class today. And I was like, I need some better girl. Ben and Joel cure everything. Uh, yeah. But we, I mean, we had guys, we had guys uh, in a country when there was a coup. Right. And they were like locked down in a hotel, like hanging out with the deposed president, like, that's cool. We had uh, somebody, uh, there was a picture of uh, Master Chief Nina Ciccinelli, and uh, they blew up a hotel. There was like a bomb that went off in the hotel where they were at, and you see her like running, and then oh, they wow. captured her in the paper, yeah. like sprinting out the door. Like I think they're a lot more risk averse now. Like stuff still happens, but I don't think it quite gets like that anymore. No, 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 no. And Occasionally. But I mean, the thing is when you're in some of these countries, you. You don't right. know when stuff. I mean, right. stuff happens. You know what I mean? Well, correct me if I'm wrong. International training. They used to be the guys who they did some stuff that wasn't so much training. They as... were doing op evals. They were basically, if you heard of that book, not your father's coast guard. Yeah. And yeah. I, I would like to plug that only because Matt Mitchell, the guy that wrote the book, was at ITD when I was there, oh, okay. <laughs> and he was doing all his freedom of information act stuff to get all those files, which was amazing. The passion that he put into that book to get all those stories was was awesome. But basically, these guys were going down to like Bolivia and South America, and you know they were right. doing like drug raids with yeah. the DEA, and it was crazy. Like combat, it was yeah, essentially I, combat. I actually know a guy who, and you might have served with him, Mario. I can't think of his last name. Uh, Rente? Yeah. No, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was at ITV with Mario for my first time at, yeah. around in uh, in Yorktown, where he uh, he um, his wife thought he was dead for like three days. On one of those trips. Uh, Trinidad and Tobago. Is that where it was? Yeah. Yeah, and funny story about that, um, I, I believe it was Trinidad. When I was going to Trinidad, I was I used to rock climb when I was active duty before I got hurt. And I was talking about climbing in Trinidad and what how amazing I'm like there's so many peaks and so many things to climb there. And there's a lot of vegetation, so the climbing there is a little difficult, but um, he was like visibly upset and he's like, You need to be careful and like 
I'm like, relax, dude. Like, you know, and Mario's like, Mario was one of the guys at IT that I looked up to. Right. At the time, like, I was a BM2, just made BM1. He's this, like, salty BM, and he was, uh, you know, he was like our, he was like our force protect, main force protection guy. He was the guy that had the kit that had everything. Like, mm-hmm. if you needed anything and you were in the middle of the jungle, Mario would be like, I got it. Like, super right. survivalist, you know? And I just, I, I learned all that from him. And uh, he ended up sitting me down and telling me the story of how right. basically he, he was on a, a patrol boat. I think it was like old school. Yeah, I it was know. like an '82. I, think. I heard the story of his retirement. And they pulled, ceremony, they pulled in. Yeah, yeah, they pulled in and they went hiking and they climbed and they just kept going and kind of like, oh, let's keep going. And they ended up. Mario fell and got injured and he okay. couldn't walk. And and again, I might be not exact on the story because it was he told me this story like 12 years ago. Right. But uh, the guy that was with him was like, I'm gonna go get help. And when the guy went to go get help, he fell and died. Like he broke his neck. And, but it was like not even a quarter mile from where Mario was, but he had no idea. Right. And he was just there for days, just sitting there, like dehydrating, you know, starving. Like he's like, what the hell's going on? Nobody's coming. So eventually they did launch a search and rescue mission. I believe it was like a farmer that found him. Right. You know, that, but I know like, like his wife, like, oh, yeah. legitimately, like they told her, yeah, he's. Yeah, he's the Coast Guard thought, missing an yeah. the Coast Guard yeah. thought he was like dead pretty yeah. much. Yeah. It's like a body recovery at that point. Wow. And they found him like barely clinging on to life. And, right. And uh, it was just an amazing story to hear, but I was like, wow, man, like, that's crazy. That's definitely made you a prepper. Like, right. You buy something like that. Right. Oh, yeah. 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 And he already kind of was. Yeah. Like, yeah, <laughs> and, he, and it's, like, funny because I, I look back to it. And it's funny you brought him up because I think about, like, what made me that way. Right. And I'm still like that now. Like, everything is – I have, like, all my little kits for everything. And I, like, like – nope. Him and this guy, James Maggard, who's an MK. It's like James Maggard and Mario Rente, man. They turned me into like this prepper, like always be ready, always have all this stuff. And it, I will say, it kind of curtailed into saving my career in the Coast Guard because I, I as you guys know, uh, you know, there's a nickname for a guy who's into a lot of gear. Right. We won't say it on here. Right. But, right. Yep. Gotcha. It rhymes with gear. Right. And uh, I was that guy, and I always loved like gear and equipment. Like after I left that unit. When I went to um, the Middle East, it was like, you know, I want all the guys to have the best stuff to do these boardings out in the Middle East, you know, and like, I carried like all kinds of crazy stuff, probably stuff that I didn't need to carry. We joke around in the in the DSF community is like in the beginning, you want to molly like everything to your vest, but then as you actually operate, you take crap off, right. and the dudes that have been doing it for a while, you have like bare minimum on your on your kit. I think it was in uh, <laughs> Platoon, remember the movie yeah, Platoon, yeah. where Charlie Sheen's like passed out from all the stuff he's carrying, and the sergeant's like, well, you don't need that, <laughs> yeah. you don't need that, you don't need yep, that. Yep. I'll so, carry the rest of this for you. Yeah. So I got into the gear, and then when I was at Miss New York, um, you have to, uh, FP teams at the time, they're gone now, but you, you had 12 guys. So right. you had to have collab- everybody, collateral supported the team. You didn't have a support element. So I became the gear cage guy. And I always wanted to make sure we had the best stuff. You know, before the UAL, each team could kind of have what they wanted. Merry Christmas. Yep. Right. Yeah, that's Merry right. Christmas. That was the, yeah, that was the yep. best team. Not saying we had a big budget, but. Right. Big budget. Yep. So, ring. Yeah. So we bought a lot of cool stuff and useful stuff. I wasn't just like, oh, let's just molly this because we need it. I mean, it was, right. you know, really I wanted the guys to be the safest possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, what I would say the most tragic point of my career was uh, Sean Lynn dying mm-hmm. in 2010. Mm-hmm. I was his uh, first slash team chief and I was at VTOC with him. Okay. We were going through the basic tactical operators course for those that don't know what that is. At the time, it was the uh, essentially what you had to get through to uh, be on a team. Mm-hmm. And that's where you got your close quarters combat training and all your range and marksmanship and all that stuff. Um, fast roping, hook and climb. Right. So when we were there, my team had already qualified us in um, fast roping, but we hadn't gotten a chance to do hook and climb. So when we were doing it at BTOP, my team was actually, at, uh, at the time, Miss New York was deployed to CENTCOM. Okay. So there was only like five or six of us back, and I had just gotten to the unit. So they were like, hey, you're going to BTOC. And when I went, um, we, we were doing, they, they don't do hook and climb and fast rope at BTOC anymore, to my knowledge. In fact, I don't even think they do BTOC anymore. I think now it's just called TAC, Tactical Operators Course. Sure. I heard, and it's all just one, sure. it's all just one course and it's like everything. Mm-hmm. So we, uh, we were doing the, at the end, hook and climb, fast rope, and pretty much by then you like feel like a rock star. You've been through all this, CQC training, all the dudes training you were like Green Berets and SEALs and you're just like high-fiving each other, you know. Well, back then the water survival program was not as 
robust as it is now. I would say it was a little bit more reactionary. Um, a good example, one of the things I thought was stupid, you used to jump in the water, right? And they make you tread with all your gear on. Right, I remember that. And it was like two minutes of treading with gear on, and a lot of the teams would even increase that time. Um, and I'm like, this is what we have all this flotation. Why are we treading? Why are we not immediately activating our flotation? Like, this doesn't make any sense. But it was more of a gut check, too, right. which, you know, obviously in a new special ops type program, there's a lot of gut check that goes on. Um, so we did this, did their water survival program or whatever, and then went through BTOC. Sean, unfortunately, had fallen on hook and climb into the water, right. uh, could not activate his, or he activated his TFS at the time. Turned out there was no air in his TFSs. Right. Um, Which is basically like, for anybody that knows, like a belt mounted life jacket that you had to manually act. Yep. You pulled they were up, like little kid they straight like up kidney and beans yeah, and they would float up beans under your arm, your arm. Yeah. and they would hold you in all your equipment. He tried to release his gear. By the time hook and climb policy, you would, you would run a runner up through your kit, mm -hmm. and the old kits used to release from the center. So they saw him pulling. No, of course, we don't know this for a fact, but they believe he was pulling his uh, runner instead of his cable release. His cable release was pulled, but he had he was a short, real stocky guy. He was an arm wrestler. He was a big kid. And when he pulled, he pulled to his arm extension, but the cable was longer. So the cable didn't release. Now we have all these policies that fix all these things. Yeah. And of I remember course, it used to be, like, you used to, even if you pulled it from here, you would activate and you'd, like, you'd go up to the lift with your arms, and then you still had to like give another jerk right. to get it good. Yeah, now it's like, gear, yeah. so it's super easy. Auto so, inflate, I think you have to be auto inflate now. Now they're auto, but you can, uh, depending, like when you're in the helicopter, they're actually manual, you can, because yeah, you safety. don't want them in auto if you, right. if you flip in the helo. Um, but yeah, so it's, uh, but then now you're, you're, you're asking a member to remember, hey, you just did fast roping, tomorrow you're on a boat, right. put it back in auto. So again, the water survival program now has, I was a water survival master after the fact, but unfortunately, basically, I lost one of my teammates that night. He drowned in the Chesapeake. Um, really, really difficult time for the team, for me. The Coast Guard did the right thing afterwards, and they really looked at, first of all, they let us continue the school, which to me was amazing. That the yeah. Coast Guard actually allowed a school to continue where a member died in training. Mm -hmm. And they let us graduate BTOC, um, probably one of the highest graduation rates after that. Um, obviously, everybody was pretty motivated to, to pass. Um, went back to my unit. They stood us down eventually, they built the units back up and they built the new water survival program, which was pretty good. After that point, I kind of made it my, my mission to go, that's never gonna happen again. Right. Like, none of my guys are ever gonna get lost again, based on gear or right. equipment and failures. Right, I mean, so we I, do a job where it can happen, but there's, yeah. there's good, not good, but there's reasons that are acceptable and reasons that are yeah. unacceptable. It's not gonna be equipment related. Right. So I went crazy with the equipment. I helped the Coast Guard, the, the dog at the time with the UAL and just, as much input as I could put in. I just really wanted to manage the program, but at the time I was just about to make chief. That's not, you know, something right. that's gonna happen. Kind of neat that I ended up at MSRT, going through green, made it through green team, um, found out when I was at ATOC that I had had a fractured C5 vertebrae from fast roping that got x-rayed, or uh, MRI'd, but nobody ever like told me. Pretty cool. So, Pretty cool. made it through green team with a fractured. See shock on our faces. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Made it through green team with a fractured spine. Talk That's about cool. talk about real fast what, uh, so the MIS team, uh, post 9-11, anti-terrorism team, does port security mainly, pretty much primarily, right? Uh, some law enforcement support to the sectors yep. in different areas. MSRT, what do they do? MSRT is a higher tier team. They basically do, you know, direct action, um, active shooter, that kind of stuff. It's, it's counter-terrorism, but it's at a higher level. They have canine, they have uh, precision marksmen, um, they have, you know, uh, full Cyberni chemical, biological, nuclear element that, that can respond to a full Cyberni threat, but has to actually operate with inside a contaminated area, which right. I think they're the only team in the U.S. arsenal that can do that. As far as like, you know, there's guys that do Cyberni and then there's guys that operate, but there's not like that level of both. And these guys, you know, they have an incredible amount of training um, and that's an element of MSRT, of course. And then we have the TDT tactical delivery, which, uh, you know, is our boat element, right. um, and those guys again, same thing. Killer boats. I mean, the boats are incredible. They have there um, top level training. What you guys? What boats did you have when you were there? Um, I can't. The, the, like it was before the, they had the spec LEs that were yeah. sliced, but before that they had. Um, and I, 
I should have paid more attention to the boat name, but it was basically like, uh, looked kind of like a seal boat. It was basically like this giant rib and it had four outboards and it I've was, seen that actually, all the yeah. seats are, all the seats are shock loaded. Right. So it's like, you basically put the whole team in the back and I was on them, but at that point I was so far out of the Bosa mate world and right. I knew I'd, I'd want to drive it if I asked too many questions. <laughs> so I kind of just was like, I'm not looking at the boat. <laughs> Uh, this is just a taxi for me. Yeah, just yep. I'm never gonna get to drive one of these things. I made that choice. Right. right. Um, but yeah, so uh, it was when I got hurt. They were like, "What are we gonna do with you?" And they wanted to med. They actually, the Coast Guard tried to med board me at 18 years, which is crazy. I'm like, I'm two years from retirement. You're gonna med board me? No. I will say MSRT stood up for me. They um, they wrote a letter to PSC saying we want to keep this guy. He's got a lot of experience. We can find a job for him. Basically, they kind of put me in the job that I always wanted to do, which was like the DSF equipment guy. Right. So I took over the MSRT's warehouse and I basically worked with a civilian that was there on the UAL. And at the time, MSRT West hadn't stood up. So the UAL I, is a uh, unit allowance list. Yeah. So it's basically all the gear that you're gonna get that you're allowed to get. for the team and yep. yeah, the, the stuff that yeah, you're allowed to So I started really revamping the UAL and like, the lights that we used on our weapons and like the uniforms, the type of uniforms with the cry and all. I mean, it was just cool because I had like the boots we wore. I had so much input into. Yeah, it's, like I went from being like it's like an outsized impact for like yeah, what your for what your pay grade of is. Course. That's a hugely and outsized impact. Pretty much making sure all the guys got the right gear. Right. Well, especially know? when you've seen an equipment failure with you know right. cost of life basically, right? Yeah. So, Yep, and I, I, I hung Chung's picture up in the shop. I had it framed in the shop, and it was a reminder every day that, like, when I'm there, these guys are going to have every damn thing that they need. And I fought, and you know how it is with logistics. A lot of, why do they need that? Well, because they do. You know what I mean? Like, you have to justify, well, I can get this cheaper. Why don't they use this? Because it's cheaper and it's not as good. Right. And I would in some fight. cases, you get what you pay for. Right, and it was nice, and the operators enjoyed having an operator in supply right. that they could come to and be like, yo, we're going to CENTCOM cheap, we need this. Like, and I would be like, let's do it. And I would, right. I would go to bat, and, and it was cool because the command would listen to me too, and I would come to them and go, hey, we should get this. It's safer for the guys. It's lighter weight. You know what I mean? And then they would be like, okay, sounds good, cheap, buy it. Like, so it was, a, it, was a, it was a cool job, and it kind of like, even though it wasn't, you know, the rock star operating like I, I was doing before, it was really neat to be able to get back to the team and work with the guys on that, that policy level, you know, especially only as a chief. Yeah, no, um, you have a huge impact. And then they allowed me sure. to sit till, you know, my 20 and retire out of that job, which was pretty cool. Yeah, very cool. Did you know John Lawler? Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Fishers. Oh, yeah. He's at a... Uh, Fish, Fish School. Yeah. Fish School in uh, Charleston. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, he actually, so it's funny, he has a tactical jet. Oh, yeah. The patches, yeah. and uh, we just talked about getting those in the shop here. Did you? Nice. Yeah, and, uh, and a pale horse, of course. Yeah. We want to have him in our shop, because I was like, oh, dude, you got to put it in there. Well, Sean, he's going to be an entrepreneur, man, one day. Yeah, oh, he's great. Yeah, he'll yep. fall, in, fall in line. Uh, so let's talk about, let's go back to the story time real fast. First SAR case ever. First SAR case. Uh, the first case. It could be anything. Man, else. I was at E2, j literally on the boat for... Three days of me reporting the ventures, they got underway. Right, typical. Yeah, typical. Like three days. So I got there, everybody was on stand down, 72s before they leave. Right. So I got there, and of course, everyone's like, yeah, we're getting underway in three days. And I'm like, uh, They're like what? here's your wreck. Yep. We'll see you in three days. <laughs> Pretty much. So we got underway. We had been underway for maybe three or four days. So now I'm like out of boot camp a total of like a week. Right. And the uh, HSC, uh, his name was Julio Galvan, this guy. Or not HSC, it was HS2, it was independent duty. Yes. And uh, he went uh, down in this Boston whaler that we had found with the SAR case, and this guy sliced his Achilles tendon open, like in half, with Sorry a fillet knife. And uh, yeah, <laughs> and I was standing there on the boat deck, and he looked up at me and he was like, You, get down here, put pressure on this. And I'm like, What? <laughs> so like, I climbed down the Jacob's ladder and like grabbed this, this like gauze, and I'm like, His Achilles tendon's like, you know, squirting out of his yeah. land. I'm like, oh my God, this is so crazy. There's <laughs> blood all over the deck of the boat. And I'm just thinking like, here I am. Right, the like, Coast this is why like, I joined the Coast Guard. This is it, yeah. yeah. So yeah. it was, like, that was my first case and it was like seven days out of boot camp. So, That's awesome. Like, yeah, it was that awesome. wild, yeah. Right. And, that was pretty cool. And then you got off that boat and somewhere a BM1 or a Chief went, uh, aren't you there for watch? <laughs> yeah. No, <you're> <laughs> Go break in on help. Right. You know? Help look out. First, uh, first case is a coxswain. Oh man, I'm trying to think what my first case as a coxswain was. It was a tow. Um, 
It was pretty lame. It was just a toe. Yeah, just toe. Yeah, and just say what Bo brought it back. Yeah, didn't, yeah. didn't break anything or. Yeah. Nah, it was easy. Sweet. Easy day. Was it on forty one? Because that was. Yeah. Oh yeah. You're, you're 40, driving a tow truck. Stern tow. <laughs> Stern tow in from Tampa Bay. Come into the inlet there by Cortez. Put him inside tow. Take him to the dock. A longbow key. You know, no the moorings. Easy day. Easy day. What yeah. about? Let's see. First time you ever put somebody in handcuffs. Uh, fisherman. Fisherman. What yeah. do you do? Uh, warrant. He had warrant? a warrant. Yeah. yeah, and he was, he was, it's actually funny. <laughs> I always say like, man, this guy must have been arrested so many times. Because as soon as I asked him his name, of course they give you like a fake name. And then right. I'm like, I need to see some ID. So eventually he gave me some ID. I actually kind of bullshitted him. I was like, hey, look, man, I don't know if you're an illegal immigrant. If you don't give me an ID, I'm going to have to take you to INS for holding. And he's like, what? And I was like, yeah, I mean, you could be an illegal immigrant. I don't know that. Like, right. I need to prove your citizenship. So he's like, oh, hold on, man. And he like went and got his ID card. And I'm like, I totally smoked that guy. Yeah. But he gave me his ID and then I ran it. And we used to have those pagers that you could run, FDLE pagers in Florida. Okay. They were like a- uh, Yeah, I remember, I, like I've seen them. Yeah, like a little page. Yeah, yeah they were all super old. Yeah. It was like a text pager and you could run warrants through it. So like, I punched him through and, and he had a warrant. So I called up and they were like, yeah, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna take him. So I was like, okay. So I was like, sir, do you have a warrant? And he was like, yep. And I was like, okay. And he, and he goes like this, I got you. And he turned around and he literally <laughs> got into, got got into, into the it. handcuffing yes. position. Right. And I was like, what? Wow, this is like doing it at school. Yeah, like, I don't even know what to do. Right? You made this so easy. I was like, wait, because you because because he did it. And then I'm thinking like, all right, I know the commands in order. And he just jumped ahead. So now I got to like go into the commands right, in my right. head. It's then, like singing the ABC yeah, song. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I went through, cuffed him. He was super cool, man. We put a vest on him. And, and he was, I was like, hey, you know, I'm just doing my job. And he's like, no, no, I'm not mad at you, man. You got to do what you got to do. So yeah, that was awesome. pretty cool. We had a couple, we had a couple uh, rough ones. We had a couple guys uh, that we had to wrestle down at Cortez. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we had a, I'll never forget the, uh, the the guy, he was like a, I think he was like a pro wrestler, but he was a fisherman. Right. And he was huge. And uh, the B, at the time, the BM1, he was BM2 that made BM1, had to like baton this guy. And the guy was like, grab, he was like on a chain. He's like, yeah. And he's like, oh, wham, yeah. and he's wailing on. And the guy was just like, yeah. And I'm thinking like, oh my God, this guy. This is a guy who's had like ladders <laughs> smashed oh, over. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And right? I was like, like, oh my God, this is going to turn into like a W. He's going to turn on this guy, Tony, the, the BO. And I'm like, just throw him over. And Tony was like super sk- too, super tall, super skinny. Right. Eventually he did go down and they, they cuffed him. And they had to use two sets of cuffs because his arm oh, was yeah. so big. Yeah. He couldn't get him behind his back. But it was just funny. That's awesome. Good. Yeah. yeah, I remember uh, so whenever you were talking about you're you're waiting for that moment on that first uh, first time to handcuff somebody and you want to like you want to give the command make sure you do it all right. I saw one guy in Miami one time and he talked him through straight textbook. <laughs> yeah. Like, on the end of this dock and dude, ten minutes later, like, this guy's still not in handcuffs. I'm like, dude, you better get the guy in handcuffs. Yeah. He's like, he's like, like yeah. widen your yeah. stance. Nope. Right. Widen your stance. The whole way. A little wider. Yeah. yeah. Come on. Out more. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Spread forward your the waist. Yeah. Like, come on. No, it's good. Well, hey, Mike, uh, we appreciate you sharing your stories, man. Yeah. Tell us about tell us about what you're into these days. So, uh, on retirement, basically, when I was sitting at a desk at MSRT, told you I've always been an entrepreneur. Um, loved radio, loved, I was a DJ as a hobby, got into DJing on, the, on Hot 100, Max Media here in Hampton Roads, uh, really just got into broadcasting and, and loved it. During that time, I kind of, uh, I've always been a cigar and coffee guy. Obviously, as both mates, what do we love? Coffee, right? And like you said, we don't really have a taste for good coffee. Yeah, we just, the best coffee it's gotta be black, sometimes. It's gotta yeah. be black and don't wash my mug, right? 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 So I got into coffee at ITD from traveling, good coffee, and picked up a taste for you know French press and pour overs and Italian roast and all this stuff. Which is kind of funny, man, because some of the places that ITD goes, like yeah, but even you're if talking the places, about Nesti, you know, like the Nesti, Nest, uh, Nest Cafe. Nest, yeah, Nest Cafe. Funny, because yeah, yeah. I also got a taste for instant coffee that Did way, nice, and yeah. I still drink it occasionally, and my fiance thinks I'm crazy for drinking instant. <laughs> She's like, you own a coffee company, why are you drinking instant coffee? And I'm like, it's different, and I like it. <laughs> Um, but I got into coffee and of course cigars were always something that bonded, everybody bonded, right? right? Somebody has a baby, you have a cigar. Somebody gets married, you have a cigar. You're deployed with the boys, you have a cigar. Like that's just our time. So I always said, I want to do a cigar shop. And I said this my whole career, I'm going to do a cigar shop one day. So when I was in the nightlife industry as a DJ, I got the opportunity to meet some cigar industry people. And I basically, of course, what can I do to get in this industry? sell cigars like you know get a license 
and an uh, OTP license called Other Tobacco Products here in the state of Virginia and sell cigars. And I was like, all right, I'm going to do it. So at the nightclubs I was at, I would actually sell cigars. Like, I'd be DJing and I would get a girl that I knew from like a waitress or a bartender be like, hey, if you're off tomorrow, meet me at the club. You're going to go on the patio. I'm going to have you sell some cigars. Cool. And it, would, and it worked. And I would sell like a lot of cigars that way. And then I just kept going and going and grinding at it till eventually the cigar and coffee thing became more of a love than the DJ thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I actually, uh, when I did retire from the Coast Guard, decided to go brick and mortar, um, opened up Primo Cigars and Coffee, which you're sitting in now, and here we are. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I, uh, I actually retired as a DJ. I did my last show this summer at Lunacy down at the beach, okay. uh, Virginia Beach, and just kind of like, you know, put that behind me. I got a two year old. Um, it's just too much being at the club till right. three, four it's, in the it's morning. The hours, right? We're yeah, and then I got to come in here and open up the next day, and it's like that. You know, I'm at this point now. I'm, I'm, you know, 41 years old. I'm like, this is where my focus is. This is my right. future. I just see 16 years from now when that kid's 18, you're gonna be back at it. I feel it. No, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah, and it's it. creepy at that age when right, you're in the right, club. Right, like, what are like, you doing? Like, 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 <laughs> yeah, like, how old is that DJ? He looks <laughs> super old and weird. Right. Um, but no, so I, I got linked up with Pale Horse Coffee, um, which was great at the time. They were Seaside and Seabag Locker Coffee, and they were uh, the guy who owns it uh, owned it at the time was a retired Navy uh, commander, and uh, his wife uh, was a retired chief, and they were basically running this coffee company, and uh, he was getting well, I shouldn't say he was retired he was about to retire, and when he did retire he wanted to re relocate to Hampton Roads. So I was like, cool, man, like we should link up when you get here. And I was selling his coffee out of the shop pretty successfully. And uh, he merged with an existing company called Pale Horse Coffee. And uh, the, the, one of the owners was locally. Uh, he was an Army, um, 101st Airborne, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, retired. And uh, basically when they joined, they kind of were like, hey, we're looking for more partners. You already sell our coffee. Do you want to get in? So I, I went into the company, we picked up a fourth partner. Uh, we joke around, say we're the four horsemen, you know, it's a pale horse. Yeah. Um, so the, he's Air Force. So we have an Air Force, Army, Navy, and Coast Guard. Very cool. I'm the only prior enlisted. Right, so you're doing all the work. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I joke around and I'm always like, I'm the one that keeps you grounded. If not, you guys would be a war room and right. the good idea for area would just be crazy. <laughs> So, uh, no, they're all great guys. Uh, very, very intelligent, very good businessmen, all of them. Um, I was very thankful that they brought me on. Yeah. And uh, so we're opening up a roastery and coffee shop in Chesapeake, okay. uh, where Big Ugly Brewing used to be on South Battlefield. The grand opening is going to be Halloween. The, uh, we actually were on the front page of the Virginia Pilot this morning yeah, uh, right. for the article. Yeah, very cool. And, uh, and then I'm continuing to sell Pale Horse. So I'm keeping the shop. Primo is a separate thing. You know, My love for tobacco and cigars is just insane and I just love how it brings people together so uh, I decided to keep you know keep the shop and then uh, we sell pale horse here of course as right. well so if you can't make it down to Chesapeake you can pick up you know coffee here awesome awesome so how can they how can they find you online so uh, palehorsecoffee.com you can go there we actually do ship we actually started out originally as an internet-based company right. so you, we ship all over um, actually a lot of my coasty friends that I kept like my buddy in Puerto Rico he buys our coffee all the time. We ship, you know, all over the U.S. Um, we what was this it. one again? What, what do we do? This is uh, Southern Whiskey. Southern Whiskey. Yeah, highly yeah, recommend it's good. it, man. Yeah, yeah it's, it's very good. good. Yeah. We have 18 infused flavors. We have uh, eight different bean origins. Um, we, we make, you know, seasonal flavors. We have a pumpkin cream pie that we just came out with for, obviously, the... Yeah, it's the first day of fall. Pumpkin spice season. Yeah, so there you go. we did that. Um, but it's, what's kind of cool is we're not just taking syrups and dumping it in your coffee like you go to the, some of these other places. We actually infuse it into the roast. Oh, so okay. when you get Southern Whiskey Coffee, it's its own blend of coffee, which is okay. cool. Yeah. Um, we won't name any of the other chains. Yeah, yeah. You all know who we're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, other other people. I almost said it. I was like, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. other people. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so you can get that online. We, we also have what I think is cool. See the six bags right over there? Yep. You guys can't see, but they can see. Um, it's called Coffee for a Cause. So what it is is uh, we have we're, we're, we're trying to get to ten. I guess it doesn't matter, right? We'll just pick. Yeah, the grab, a, grab first. Well, you yeah, that's, that's, two of them. that's How about that. Is that good? Perfect. So this is uh, Hunter Seven. Hunter Seven is basically uh, provides uh, medical treatment to uh, people from the burn, like veterans that are not getting medical coverage from the VA mm -hmm. for things okay. like from the burn pits. 
Um, so what happens is we do um, 50% of the money from that bag of coffee goes to that charity. Wow, huge. So we actually make it for them. Boot campaign, um, as you can see, it says Lace Up America. This is basically uh, life improving programs for veterans and military families. So it's like cool. a military family support program. Very we cool. also do First Bite, which is the Military Working Dog Association. Pennies for Quarters, which is a homeless veterans organization. Um, and then two that are local, Climb Four, which is a really neat charity. They take veterans with PTSD on hiking and backpacking and camping trips, and Very they actually cool. provide them the gear to do it. Oh, wow. um, Leslie, the, the founder of that company, she's amazing. Basically, she had been given a bunch of equipment by EOD guys that she was friends with because of her own PTSD to go on this uh, Adirondack Trail hike. She did like 2,000 miles, I forget what, it was crazy. She went on this and she, it changed her life. And she's like, I want to do this for other people. Right. So we, we made a coffee for her. It's a hunter and mountain roast uh, coffee. Um, and then Pennies for Paws, which is a local animal nonprofit. That's our only non-military charity right now. Um, I'd say that's a worthy one though. It is. And uh, it's, it's great. They do so much for, you know, for all of the, uh, the different pet rescues in the area. So uh, we're trying to eventually have 10 charities, 10 okay. nonprofits. Awesome. Um, and all available online, right? Yep, Very so you can cool. get it all online right now. I think we're still doing the special. If you buy three of the nonprofit coffees, the coffees for a cause, um, you get three bags of coffee and uh, and uh, one of those new our new pet horse mugs, the black and red mugs. Very cool. Um, and it's like a fifty dollar combo pack. So cool. Definitely uh, something to check out. Yeah, Mike, you're making awesome. moves, man. I yeah, love yeah, it. Yeah. I, like what Try a, what a heck of a Try what a heck of the uh, company portfolio. I think you got uh, well, cigars and coffee, dude. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. they really do. Solid way they to do. retire. They do. And you know what's funny is I, I find in the business world uh, different than the, uh, the military. We're used to just get the stuff done. You know, right. we get stuff done. Like, we don't have any patience. Yes. Yep. Yeah, no. Everything's like yesterday. And I'll call some of these people in the civilian world and I'll be like, hey, um, you know, da, 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 when can we meet up? They're like, no, maybe like next week. And I'm like, what about this week? Why not now? Like, what are you doing right now? What are you now? doing right this like, second? Yeah, it's yeah. like, and it's just very like, the sense of, what I find is that the sense of urgency a lot of times it's just gone in the civilian world, especially right. like on a Friday, trying to get anything done. Everyone's already at the weekend. And I'm like, now nah, we still got three hours left in the business day. Let's do this. Nice. So yeah. I'm uh, You spend a tour at a training center. You know it, it exists in the military <laughs> world too. Let's yeah. be honest. Well, also too, is like even the DSF, it's like you do things, like you'll be at the range and they'll be like, go do this, you got one minute. And you're like, you can get a lot of stuff done in it's a minute. It's amazing what you can, yeah. Yeah, you can get a lot of stuff done in a minute. So when I see people and it's like, you know, it's like two hours before the end of the work day and they're like, oh yeah, we'll just, we'll just do this just on Monday. And I'm like, what? <laughs> so well, I'm learning, I'm learning that transition from being, you know, and luckily my partner here, I'm located inside Southern Eats, which uh, to give them a plug, awesome Southern food restaurant. Um, Brian they're Shrek, not yeah. open today, but I smell it, right? Like yeah, when Monday, I in, yeah, Mon and I was going to say that's yeah. leftover from yesterday yeah. from our brunch. Monday is uh, our closed day, obviously. Right. And uh, Brian is a retired uh, senior chief from the Navy. Um, awesome guy, worked in aviation. Um, you know, me and him are on the same page. So I, I do enjoy, that's like with Pale Horse, I enjoy working with other veterans right. because we all have that same just drive and, you know, mentality. So, yeah, Mike, man, totally appreciate yeah, it. Thanks, Please, guys, guys go, go, thanks, go visit uh, Primo Cigars and Pale Horse Coffee, right? They'll be linked all over uh, social media feeds, but obviously doing great things for, uh, for a ton of charities and then. You're also supporting uh, the veteran community. So, yeah. Mike, we appreciate it, man. Thank we, you, guys. We thank you for your service. It's been an honor to be on the show. Yeah, we, uh, Anytime you guys want to host a show, a different spot, you can just meet here and do your show. Right? Yeah. Hey, thank you. So awesome. awesome. yeah. I, I, may, I may be your coffee sponsor. There you go. <laughs> Most mates need coffee. Yeah, they do. Well, we appreciate it, man. Thanks, man. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for taking the time to listen. If you like what this podcast is about and what we delivered, look us up at theyhadtogooout.com or your favorite podcast platform. And like, comment, subscribe, and share so we can keep the momentum up and do bigger things going forward. Look for a new episode every Sunday. Until then, fair winds and following seas.